Hello, this is ABC World News with Diane Sawyer, and unfortunately, Diane Sawyer is not here, so we have the fabulous Mark McNeil and in her place. So, he is also from IBC, filming live from Baja Tustin. Well, thank you, George. Um, My name's not George! Right, Fred. We'll be talking. Are we going to talk about the events of the world? No. Who cares? We're talking about supply. Supply is a relationship. It's a relationship between the price that sellers are going to get. Remember, we're on the supply side we're making, of the market now. We're talking about sellers' decisions. And the quantity supply. The quantity supply is the quantity that they will produce and offer for sale in the market. That's quantity supply. And when we talk about quantity supply, we're talking about for a particular good in a particular market during a particular period of time. So we have to specify what is the good, what is the market, what is the period of time. Now, the law of supply says that this relationship between price and quantity supply is positive. That means that when the price goes up, the quantity supply goes up, more will be supplied. And if the price goes down, the quantity supply will go down. This naturally assumes ceteris paribus, which you people know to be... Latin. For? Uh, okay, get off the phone. Um, other things constant. Everything besides price is held constant. We'll talk about that in a minute. But this just shows the relationship between price and quantity supply, assuming everything else is constant. Why is this relationship positive? Remember with demand we asked why is that relationship negative? Now we're asking why is the supply relationship positive? And the answer is that, generally speaking, 100% no, generally speaking, opportunity costs increase as quantity supplied increases. To produce more, you incur higher opportunity costs. There are examples of this. Uh, for you, for instance, <clears throat> if you signed up for, we'll say, five classes this semester, this term, why did, why did you stop at five? Um, there's a marginal benefit to getting more classes done and finishing your schooling sooner and so forth. Oh, and you make decisions marginal cost, marginal benefit. Why didn't you just take ten classes? And the answer is, the more classes you take, the opportunity cost in terms of what you have to sacrifice to give up the time to, to study that class increases. You can take one class easily with almost no loss. You can cut it out of, cut unimportant things out of your life and the cost of taking the first class is quite small. If you take a second class, is the, is the cost of the second class higher than the first? Correct, it is higher. Yes. Do you have to cut out more important parts of your life? Yes. yes. The third, higher again. The fourth, higher again. If you're taking the eighth class, uh, with the eighth class, have you cut out every other aspect of your life and the eighth class you're starting to cut out sleep as well? So class by class, as you add more, the opportunity cost of, of finishing those classes increases. Sand in Orange County. I want to be a sand producer. Well, it turns out, right nearby where my yard is in the center of Irvine, there's a place that nobody really uses but has lots of sand. And I can get to it easy. It's got lots of sand, good sand. And I can go load up my trucks and bring them into the yard and supply sand for Irvine or for Orange County cheaply say uh, $50 a ton, $100 a ton. Now, what if people want more and I have to produce more sand? I have to go get another sand pit someplace. Is it going to be as close? No. Is it going to be as easy to get to? No. Is it going to be more costly for me to go to that second place or will I have to pay more rent because the opportunity costs are higher for that land? But in any case, the opportunity cost for that next place will be higher and I will only provide that second batch of sand if the price is higher than $100 because I have higher costs. Now the third example of course has to do with my house in beautiful Baja Tustin. Here's the layout of the house. Here's the house right here. Here's the garage. This is a driveway right here. That's a driveway. This is the front yard. There's a, a sidewalk here. Back in the back there's a lemon tree. Aunt Peg's uh, sacred persimmon tree is here. And right there, there's a, a lawn area here, and then garden area. Tomatoes and zucchini. My mother's Italian, and the meaning of life to an Italian is to be able to grow tomatoes and zucchini in the summertime. Life has no meaning to, Italian with, to an Italian without that. So I would sit right here 
in the, on the lawn here, in my little lawn chair, in the shade of this persimmon tree in the summertime, smoking my pipe and reading the Wall Street Journal, and watching my tomatoes and zucchini grow, and I was super happy. But I had too many tomatoes, and so, like many people in Baja Tustin, they put a little table out here and with, a, with a sign that says, Tomatoes, $2 a bag, or something like that. And a little box, there's a little box right there. People come and take the, uh, a bag of tomatoes and they put their two bucks in the box. Now I understand people have been having tr trouble with the concept lately. I'm sure they're confused. They take both the tomatoes and the box. I, I think they're not supposed to do that. Anyway, so what does my supply of tomatoes in Tustin look like? Well, you know, normally I would just take these tomatoes and anything I had left over, I'd put out there 10, uh, 10 pounds maybe a week. And I'd charge a dollar a pound, and life was good, and I'd make a little money. But people would come up to my door, and, and they would say, Hey! Hey! You're out of tomatoes! I'd say, uh, so go to the store and buy it. No, 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 no. These are Tustin tomatoes. They're different. They have the flavor of Tustin, in, of Tustin soil in them. There's nothing like them. You must grow more. So I say, okay, if I grow more, how am I going to grow more? Get rid of the lawn. I could get rid of my zucchini and make tomatoes out of it. Is that a higher opportunity cost to me? Yes. Do I have to be paid for it? Will I do it for a dollar a pound? No. I will only do it if I get a dollar and a half. So I'm putting them out and people come to my door. Hey, you're out. We need more. Now what do I do? Go get, ahead. Rid, get rid of the lawn. I have to get rid of the lawn and plant tomatoes there. And now I have to sit in the hot sun in that chair reading my uh, Wall Street Journal and smoking my pipe and watching my tomatoes grow. So sure enough, I'm putting them out there, but they got to pay me for that. I got an umbrella that helps. Now, what if they're still banging at my door? What do I have to do next? Eh, I got to tear something out here. This was a patio. I'd plan right there. What the heck? Get rid of that patio. But is the opportunity cost higher again? Yes. It's your fax machine. That's a phone. Whose phone is this? I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, so. Kids. Kids. Okay, so I will do that, but again, I have oper a higher opportunity cost. I will only do it if I'm paid. And finally, if people want more than that, I don't care. I'll tear out my front lawn. My only problem is, those little rotten children who are going to school, they will pick my tomatoes and throw them at each other. But I have a solution for that. Do you know what it is? Electric fence. Raise the price. Rottweiler. Anyway, I will tear out the front line, but they better pay. Now, is there a price at which I would pair, uh, tear out the house and the garage? There is a price. But would the price of, of tomatoes ever get to that point? No. So here is my supply curve. There it is. Is it positively slow? Is it a positive relationship? Yes. And what do you know if the price for tomatoes is $2 a pound? If the price is $2 a pound, and I will produce 30 pounds a week. What if the price of tomatoes is two fifty a pound? Well, I will produce 40. This is a change in this movement from this point, we'll call it A, to that point, we'll call it B, is a change in the quantity supply. Um, it's a movement. Change in quantity supply is a movement is caused by a change in the price from 2 to 250. But what then is a change in supply? And the answer is a change in supply is a shift of the entire supply curve and it's caused by a change in one of the things that's held constant. It, one of the things that's held constant. And here's the list. If you want the stupid mnemonic device, uh, uh, thank you Mr. Keani. Uh, it is really tough schools eat their students. Really tough schools eat their students. R is resource prices, input prices, like land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurship. Uh, T is technology. If the technology changes, that changes producers' decisions. If the uh, uh, S is the number of sellers, and the reason... Uh, the reason that uh, this is one of them is that market supply is the horizontal sum of all individual suppliers. I'll explain this in a second. Uh, expectations. Whose expectations? Sellers. About what? 
about the future price. That's it. Uh, T is per unit taxes or subsidies. And these little asterisks here refer to things that change the cost of production for sellers. I'll explain this in just a second. Okay. So, turns out, turns out that I'm selling my tomatoes, I'm selling them for real money here, and with all this money, what do I do? I go buy the SLS, and I park it right there, right there, pointing outward. So the noise, nose is, painting, is pointing toward the, the uh, street for maximum impact to impress my neighbors. And sure enough, I'm making money hand over fist. And then, this neighbor right next door here peeks over my fence and says, he's growing tomatoes. And so, this neighbor puts a table right out there and copies my... Uh, my operation exactly, and start selling tomatoes. Now, what happens to the supply of tomatoes in Tustin? At a price of a dollar, there won't be ten. There will be twenty. At a price of a dollar fifty, there won't be twenty. There will be forty, sixty, eighty, a hundred, etc. Yes, because now we're adding my quantities at each price plus my neighbor's quantity. That's why it's the horizontal sum. So, at every price, the quantity increases. Boom, pity, boom, pity, boom. Now, S2 is the new supply curve. This is a change in supply. It is a shift. And what caused that change in supply? Which of these factors? Sellers. No, change. Good. Wow. Change in the number of sellers. Good for you. Now, then a third one comes and starts selling. Boom. We have to add that third one's quantities at every possible price. And now we get S three here. And can I get as much money for my tomatoes as I was before? No. No. Can I afford my SLS now? No. No! I can't make the payments. They're starting to, they're calling me, telling me they're going to repossess it. I have to park it in the garage and double lock it. It's terrible. And finally, my cousin Guido comes over. He says, how's it going? And I say, not too good, Guido. He says, why? And I say, you know, this jerky neighbor and that jerky neighbor, they're selling tomatoes just like me, and now my price has gone down. I can't sell them for a decent price. I'm going to lose my SLS. They're going to repossess it. Can't make the payments. And Guido says, maybe I can help. I, I specialize in resolving disputes of this sort. So he says, I said, well, you know, give it a try. So he goes across the street here, knocks on the door very politely, goes in. I hear a little chatting, but not much. In a few minutes, comes back. And this guy comes and takes away this, uh, this uh, table. Comes back and he says, your neighbor across the street is a reasonable person. <laughs> what happens to the supply curve of tomatoes and Tustin now? Oh. Is it S3 now? No, it's only S2. It's shifted left because there are fewer sellers. And finally, he goes next door. Takes a little longer, a little more noise. Comes back. This guy takes his table away. And Guido says, your neighbor is able to listen to reason. So, boom, gone. Supply shifts left. Am I making the money again? Yeah. So, what caused the shift? Something, a change in something besides price, the number of sellers. Yes? Now, what if my seed prices, water prices, fertilizer prices, any of these input prices increases or changes? What will happen to my supply curve? It'll go down. What if all the people that I hire, like you people, I have to hire you to come and help me with my tomatoes? You don't hire us. We're well, slaves. Let's, yeah, but I have, yeah. <laughs> you whine a lot, so I have to, like, give you something. But what if I hire real people to do it? Let's try that one. All right, then, if my costs go up, will I still offer for at, uh, 30 units for sale at $2 a pound? Or, because I have higher costs, do I want more money for that? Will I still offer uh, at $3 a pound, whatever this is, 50 uh, pounds? No. I will only offer the 50 pounds if the price goes up to cover my higher costs. So if my costs go up, the supply shifts left, really. It shifts towards Seattle. That's a decrease in supply because of higher costs. Could be resource prices, could be technology, could be taxes or subsidies. A tax is just a higher cost on the sale of, of uh. Anyway, so any of these things changes and the uh, there's a shift, a change in the supply of tomatoes. Um, 
So that's pretty much supply. I should be able to give you any market, tell you any story, and you distinguish. Has there been a change in the quantity supply? That would be caused by a change in the price of the good. Whereas, if something besides price changes, that would cause a shift. And the name we give to the shift is a change in supply. And the supply is caused by a change in uh, really tough schools eat their students. All right, so the next video is about we put supply and demand together and we talk about equilibrium. Thanks, kids. You're welcome. <laughs> My pleasure. Yeah.